Uh, sounds good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to one of the final sessions of the SOT event. This World of Tomorrow conference has featured over 50 thought leaders and influencers from all around the world speaking on a range of topics to help inform the direction of the organization while also engaging in conversa conversations shaping the future of societies. I am Sara Munir, your host for this session. My professional experience spans over a decade and a half. I'm presently looking after the educational concerns of secondary schools, as well as assessments and examinations for all levels in Beacon House across Pakistan. We are very honored to have with us Mr. Kyle Wagner to conduct the workshop, The Power of Simple, Strategies for School Transformation Post-COVID. This workshop will expose participants to courageous schools who are using authentic project-based experiences to engage and empower 100% of their learners and the five simple structures that they have in place to support them. Mr. Kyle is the founder and the lead trainer for Transform Educational Consulting Limited. His work with project-based learning and leading the design of innovative learning programs spans 12 years, three continents, and 15 schools. He has worked with teachers and school leaders across some of the most successful public, charter, and international schools in Asia. Mr. Kyle is also a former humanities teacher at world-renowned High Tech High and the former co-founder of Futures Academy at the International School of Beijing. Before I hand it over to Mr. Kyle, please note that during this session, we'll be requesting the viewers to record their rating on different strategies. Members of the audience will be requested to log in to live.sotevents.com to be able to participate in the audience polls. You'll be informed before each poll is activated. Please note that we have reserved one minute to record the responses of each poll. The participants can also post questions at any time during the workshop, and we will address them towards the end of the session. Now over to you, Mr. Kyle. Thanks so much, Sarah, for that introduction, uh, that lovely introduction. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, this is a very tough time for all of us um, with COVID-19. I've just been informed that a lot of people have been informed that they, uh, tomorrow, will be going back to their classrooms. So. Um, I understand the amount of flexibility, the amount of resilience um, and commitment that this takes. And, you know, my hat goes off to all of you uh, in that situation. And I really, really strongly um, want to commend you for what you're doing and also appreciate the uh, time that you're taking. And I really hope that you're going to get a lot out of this presentation. And I want to start with a story that I think most of us are familiar with. And that story um, is the three little pigs. And most of us have been told that story when we're four or five years old. But I want to relate that to the situation with schools. So you have the three little pigs, and I think most of us are familiar. Three pigs quickly build their house. One pig builds their house out of straw. And of course, we know the story. The big bad wolf comes into town, comes knocking on the doors, knocks on the first door. Little pig, little pig, let me in. And I think we know the rest of that line, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. And of course, we know what happens after that. The big bad wolf huffs and he puffs and he blows the house down. That pig, unfortunately, got eaten by the big bad wolf. Big bad wolf, though, hasn't had enough to eat and goes down to the second house. This pig is a little bit smarter, built his house out of sticks, thinks it will stand a little bit better. Shuffled it together, but probably looked at a couple of floor plans before he built it. Big bad wolf comes knocking. Little pig, little pig, let me in. As we know the response, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Big bad wolf huffs, he puffs, and blows the house in. So now two pigs have been eaten by the big bad wolf. And he finally goes down to the third house, and he thinks he's bad. He thinks he's big. He's already blown down two houses. This little pig, though, 
took some time. Took some time thinking about the floor plans, the blueprints, the most sturdy materials. Probably tested his house numerous times and knew it would withstand something strong. Maybe even strong enough for the big bad wolf. We know the story. He knocks on the door. And I'm sure it's probably not a door. It's some gated community. And the big bad wolf huffs and puffs and isn't able to blow that third house down. Now, what does that have to do with schools? I wanted to share that story because all of us in this situation, anyone who's a school teacher, a school leader, an educator anyway, has been through a very, very trying year. And we're approaching the end of that year. And there's some schools that didn't have the structures in place beforehand. We all quickly went online. We did our best, but we didn't necessarily have the kind of student driven, centered, independent environments to allow for students to be working online independently. But there were some schools that were able to make that transition into the online space. And those schools are not just the private schools, the schools that had a lot of funding, because they're schools that were public, they're schools that were charter, they were able to make this switch. And those schools were able to do things that other schools weren't. For example, what you see here is a school that when they went online, they had the systems in place to allow for student-directed learning. This here is a student's producing, editing, publishing, and curating their own class book around COVID and the experiences that their community has had with COVID. This here is a food truck project. As we all know, businesses went under during this time. I'm sure wherever you're tuning in from, you know many businesses have been affected by COVID. And students decided to take on this problem with the help of support of their teachers. And this here is a food truck project where students were creating their very own food trucks and seeing how those could be potentially used within the communities, from the financing of the food truck to the design to what food they would serve. Other students worked together with their teachers in the classes to put together class recipes and a history book of their families. They knew they're gonna be spending a lot of time with their families, so they interviewed their parents, their grandparents, they found out some secret recipes, and beyond just learning some school subjects, they had an opportunity to get in the kitchen. But it wasn't just about that book and recipes, it was about connecting, it was about learning about how to be an anthropologist and a historian, is about learning how to be a journalist and uncovering those stories from their families. And another one, one of my favorites, was one school decided it was gonna go completely off the timetable and they put together um, an art project that allowed students to really look at what were the effects of COVID, um, what were the effects in the community, and really what were the, the uh, misunderstandings. And really tried to help put together these health hygiene um, propaganda campaigns to really help the community become more informed. I'm sharing these because these are authentic project-based experiences and they had students who had worked independently before to allow for these things to happen. Now, what were those structures that they had in place to allow not just for these food trucks, these class recipe books, a class published book, a propaganda campaign, and here you see is Wellness was a huge focus during COVID, as we all know. And one teacher was tasked for the wellness program during COVID. And you can see these students here are in mass. And she took upon herself to ditch the curriculum, the mandated curriculum and said, we're gonna center things around a project. And these are students here who are creating, making, curating, editing, getting feedback on projects um, that were around the holidays and centered around woodworking projects. So I'm sharing these stories with you because these are things that courageous schools did. These are things that courageous educators like you can do, but there are structures in place that are gonna allow for these kind of things to happen. Now, in teacher-centered schools, as you see on the left side, you see a house of cards, and we know this analogy because we've seen it before. You set up a house of cards, and just like the big bad wolf, if you don't have the sturdy foundations, that house of cards is gonna fall. But the student-centered schools were able to stack learning experience upon learning experience upon learning experience, and the structures didn't fall. Because we don't know when we're going to be going back into the classroom. We don't know when we're going to go online. We don't know when we're going to go in a hybrid situation. But what we do know 
is that if we have the structures in place to allow for student-centered learning, we can weather this storm of COVID together. And those are the structures that I wanna share with you. I know you have a very packed um, evening in front of you and getting ready for tomorrow. And I hope you can take some of these um, lessons into how you structure your learning. So let's get into those five switches. Now, first of all, think of what words come to mind when you think of student-centered learning environments. Now, I'm going to allow you just to write those things into the chat window. Anything that comes to mind when you think of student-centered learning, you might think of authentic. That might be a word that comes to mind. Community, whatever words come to mind, put that in the chat window because that is what this presentation is going to be focused around. So if you want to write that into the chat window, I can see that. And Sarah's also going to be able to see that so that we can look at those words when it comes to end the presentation. Okay, so put those words down um, as you're thinking of things. And we're gonna have an opportunity also to have an interactive poll. And on that interactive poll, um, you are going to be able to respond to a couple of provocations around each of these shifts to see how you are doing in terms of each of these shifts. Let's get to the very first shift. Now I want you to notice two different schedules that I'm gonna show you. One is a schedule from a very teacher-directed standpoint, and one is a schedule from a very student-centered standpoint. And I want you, as you look at these schedules, to try to think of what are the major differences, okay? And think, how does it resemble the schedule that you have put together for your students? So here's the first schedule. Take a look. You know, let it sink in. Okay, what do you notice about this schedule compared to this schedule here? This is one particular day. I'm sorry I didn't have the whole week, but imagine that this day repeats itself for five times throughout the week. This is their schedule. For 40 minutes, they're going to social studies. For 35 minutes to 40 minutes, they're going to Spanish, then PE, then lunch, then computer skills, science, instrumental music, and dismissal. Here is the Monday schedule. I want you to look at here. Let's see if hopefully um, we have some options so I can annotate this. Okay, notice how on Monday you see this entire time block from 10 to 1230 is dedicated to project-based learning. Notice how here they have a seminar class. And seminar classes are for going a lot deeper into content. They're much more discussion-based. But notice how you have from 1 to 2.30. You have a 90-minute class here. You have a two-hour class here. You have an advisory that meets each day. So this is a chance to connect continuously to a group of students. Now, whether you're doing that online or whether you're doing that um, in person, imagine the strength of having that opportunity to connect with the same group of students each day. And notice these classes. You have blended learning here for students to be able to take their own um, online tutorials or own online classes in relation to their set goals. So some students could be working um, on an uh, accelerated reading program that might be online. Some students could be working on a math program that is online that is accelerated for them at their pace. Um, Khan Academy is a great program as well. So notice the difference between this and this. You don't see any classes listed here. You just see long blocks of time, okay? And one of the things that you might have noticed, so um, let's see, hopefully I can get out of this screen. Let's erase this pen. Okay, now, one of the things you might have noticed is that one schedule is quite rigid, and one schedule, schedule is a lot more flexible, okay? So think to yourself as you're going back to your class, well, how can I open up my schedule? Now, the question that probably is in your mind right now is, that's great, Kyle. You know, I would love to have that kind of flexible schedule. However, what is going to fill that? What are the project-based experiences, the seminar classes that are going to fill that schedule? So I'm going to share that with you in the next learning experience. Okay, and thank you. Sarah has just mentioned that a majority of the responses say interactive, more informal, more inflexible. 
thank you for those responses about a student-centered environment. And I hope this presentation is going to reflect all those things that you said a student-centered environment looked like. Now, let's look at more of the tangibles. If we have a schedule like this and it's very open, how do you create a schedule like that? Okay. And we're going to look at something else. Let's look at our space. A lot of us are going back to school, as I understood, tomorrow. And you've had the Ministry of Education says that you've got to prepare for tomorrow. I'm sure right now the level of stress and anxiety must be through the roof and very high for you. But let's look at this as an opportunity, okay, as an opportunity for us to not always do all the work ourselves, but really put students in charge. I want you to notice two different pictures here. Okay, here are two different pictures. Now, I think Sarah is able to look at the chat window. So we'll do this really quick. What are the differences that you see between these two different learning environments? Between this learning environment here and the other learning environment? What do you see as the major differences? And if you can write that in the chat window, Sarah will be able to see those responses. And I want to talk about those things as you're writing your responses. Notice here, all eyes are on the teacher. That's something you might notice. They're all sitting in their independent desk. Everything about this space relies on the teacher. It is truly a teacher-centered classroom. And there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, sometimes we really need to deliver our curriculum and sometimes it's the best way to do it. But imagine, and you probably noticed this as well, look at the way that this classroom is set up. You've got a group here, you've got a group here, you've got a group here, you've got some people who are looking over here at a gallery walk, there can be things on the walls. In this particular case, what they're doing is they're looking at different designs um, for this space because this space is just being built and kids are getting to vote and choose what kind of design they want. So consider how you use your space. Not all of us are fortunate enough to have a giant open space, but we probably have a classroom. How can we get the classroom to be another teacher for ourselves so kids aren't just relying um, on us? Okay, so that's something you probably noticed about this space. Uh, Sarah mentioned, yes, the right one is very student-centered. The left one is very teacher-centered, okay? So think about how you use your space. One is very siloed and is relying on the teacher. One is very fluid and flexible. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to take a poll here. So the way you're going to take this poll is just simply go to live.sotevents.com. Okay, so L-I-V-E dot S-O-T events dot com. Now, if you go there, it's going to take you to this active poll. Thank you. I think Sarah has already shared this in the chat window. Okay, now rate the flexibility and depth that you have in your timetables and your space. So what we just shared, is your timetable very fixed? And kids go here, 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 here for five or six different time periods of the day, or is it very flexible, fluid, based on the learning experiences? Okay, so we'll give you about another 10 seconds to take this poll. <clears throat> All right. Great. Thanks so much for uh, taking these results. I am actually quite impressed. Uh, we have 31% who are saying you're at a five in terms of your timetable and space. That's excellent. So you've got the very first part of these student-centered schools. You've got that taken care of because if you've got the flexible schedule and space, you're going to be able to have the learning experiences that are going to support it. Okay. So I see some fours, some fives. Um, it's so four is, four is is about is close to the average. So 3.5 is our average. I'm going to get away from the poll now. Don't worry. We're going to show the poll again. Thanks so much, Sarah, for sharing that. But we're around about a 3.4, okay? So think about what you can do to make your environment more flexible and more fluid. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is great, Kyle. I've got a flexible timetable. No problem. I can set the timetable. I've got a great space with my classroom. But now tell me, how, how do I structure that? And how do I really get students? I've got 25, 30 different students 
you're telling me if it's student centered, they're all going to be doing different things. How, how am I supposed to structure something like that? So that's going to take us to our next slide. Okay. So after you think about how you might allow for flexible and fluid timetables and learning spaces, let's now look at our curriculum and look at how we might be able to structure our learning experiences that are supportive of the space that we have created. Okay. Now, what I'm going to show you again are two different ways of going about this. Now, one of the things that COVID has given us the luxury of is some of us have been able to now plan and meet either at coffee shops or meeting virtually online with other teachers. You know, how many of you plan with other teachers and you work in a team? Because you have one way of looking at things where you're just looking at your subjects. Okay, so as you see here, um, let me see the pen. You've got just your subjects, art, music, drama, PE. Okay, you've got each of these, um, humanities, uh, science, language, history. Now you could look at it that way, or you could look at it this way. How might you get together with some other teachers? You might not be able to do it inside your school, but how might you connect your subject to another subject? So I'll give you an example. This here is a language teacher. This is a math science teacher, and this is a humanities teacher. And these teachers all get together and they plan learning around a project. Okay, a very meaningful, student-centered, high-impact, community-centered project. Okay, now what does that actually look like? So I want to show you what that looks like. So how do we go from subject-specific to transdisciplinary or integrated? And again, those are the different teams. So these are two different planning teams, two different grade levels, but rather than planning around the minutia of the curriculum, they plan around learning experiences. So let's take a topic such as entrepreneurship, okay? And this is going to be a little activity for you guys to do as well. Um, the activity that you're going to do is you're going to think in terms of a teacher planner. Now, let's say you're going to allow students to create their own small businesses. Students are going to work in partnerships or they're going to work individually, and they're going to create small businesses to benefit the community. So the big question being, how do we create small businesses to really benefit the community? Now, let's say you're a planner with this. Now, think about your particular subject, whether it's business, language, science, electives, math. Think in terms of your subject and think, how might you connect your subject to this project? Again, I'll give you the project. The project is they're going to create small businesses in six to eight weeks. They've got to make a profit. It's going to benefit the community. Okay? That's a simple project. Now, in the chat window, because I know Sarah's monitoring in the background, just write in the chat window, according to, it could be your subject or any subjects that you think might fit into this bigger topic of entrepreneurship. What kind of things might students be doing in each of those subjects? Okay, so I'll give you about 20 to 30 seconds to write some of those things down. You might, just for an example, in math, you might write that they're learning about profits and losses and they're learning how to put together spreadsheets. Um, and so that might be something you write for math. So write in in the chat window, how might you incorporate your subject um, into this learning experience, okay? So as you're writing that in, Sarah's gonna get some of your responses. Thanks so much for participating. I can't really see your responses, so Sarah's been great at moderating. Um, she just told me that the first poll is closed. We have 85 responses. That's wonderful. 32% um, are at four. Excellent. So we have a lot of people who are already have the flexible timetables and space to allow for these kind of learning experiences. So I'm going to erase the pen and go back now. Okay. And this is another question for you to explore and think about. So... Um, what topics might allow for more transdisciplinary opportunities for students to make connections? Okay, so think about this big question. You have the space, you've got the timetable, you might have an idea of the learning experiences, but now that you know that transdisciplinary learning experiences around a particular topic are so strong, how might you 
allow for more of those transdisciplinary opportunities. And I'm sure Sarah's going to get back to me, but I'll just give you quickly in this one. Um, in art, these students um, in design, students were creating these t-shirts. So they learned about logo design for how to create their um, advertisements. Uh, they learned about product design. That's one of the things they did as well. Um, here when they're selling, they had to learn how to put together a business plan and a proposal. So that's a lot of language if you think about it. So students put together a pitch as well that they pitched. So they had to learn about business and you had to learn about you know startups and startup costs. You had to learn about principles about supply and demand and the markets and how to reach those markets and the different types of markets. You had to learn micro, macro economics. So if you have a simple learning experience that is challenging, that is authentic, that is meaningful, you can incorporate your subjects around that. So that is a little bit of that. I'm sure you have your own ideas for topics. So now we're gonna move on to the uh, second poll. So Sarah, can you open up the uh, second poll? Rate the connection of your curriculum and learning experiences between subjects. So how well do you connect subjects in your learning experiences? So if you want to still take this poll, we're going to leave it open for about the next 30 seconds. All right. I see a lot of people are at a 4.1. This is excellent. Um, a lot of people are already making connections between their subjects. Great. And it's okay if you're here. If you're at a one or a two, thanks for being honest. So I see a couple more people taking that poll. Lots of people are at five. Excellent. Um, looks like the scores are, are going down. Be honest with yourself. Think, okay, in your subject, how often are you connecting your subject to others in really meaningful ways? Not just maybe one reference or two references from your subject, but really strategic, authentic ways. <clears throat> All right, so Sarah's gonna be monitoring this in the back end. Um, I'm gonna go back to, to this slide again. Okay, what topics might allow for more transdisciplinary opportunities? Now again, when we're looking at learning experiences, we're talking about a six to eight week learning experience, not just a one-off kind of lesson, but the whole learning experience is designed around this topic. So these students for six to eight weeks were really pursuing building their businesses and all the subjects we're working in. So it's a deep, deep learning experience. Now let's move into student choice, okay? Shift number three. Okay, there's two things, two pictures I'm gonna show you, all right? And I want you to think about your environment and think about where you kind of fall from one to five. On one side, you have very teacher-directed types of choices. Um, students are confined, all students are producing the same thing. You might say that students, uh, for example, it might be a lab and students are you know, looking at acids and bases. And you might say, what's the difference between an acid and a base? You do a lab experiment, it ends there. The teacher controls everything. There's the variables and then you do the experiment. That is on one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is really opening up for complete student driven choice when it comes to inquiry, how they're connecting, um, different content that you have to teach. It's inquiry based. You start them off with maybe a big question and they're pursuing that on their own. And I'm gonna give you an example um, in just a second of what that looks like. So limited to full autonomy. So what does it look like when it comes to student choice from a limited perspective to full autonomy? Now I'm gonna give you the example of full autonomy and I want you to really think and be honest with yourself. Um, where you stand and how you might use this as an example as you're structuring your learning experiences. Okay, so we're going to look at a learning experience that was conducted with students that were six um, and seven years old. And it's centered around dolphins, whales, and sharks. Now, you might not teach dolphins, whales, and sharks, but I want you to take one of your topics that you teach. Okay, if you're a math teacher, that might have to do with proportions and rates. If you're a science teacher, that might have to do with um, a subject in earth science or biology. Um, if you're a humanities teacher, a social studies teacher, it might have to do with different ancient civilizations perhaps. Um, 
And so I think you can think in terms of your subject. Now, in this particular subject, dolphins, whales, and sharks, it started out with a topic. Now, the very first thing that students did with this topic is, and I'm going to go from picture to picture. This is picture number one. First, the teacher exposed them to, you know, the whales, dolphins, sharks, took them to an aquarium, had them exploring. The kids were asking questions. The whole ex first experience was designed around students asking questions. What do they want to know about this topic? So no, none of the content necessarily has been taught. Um, an expert, this is a parent who came in. The parent came in and demonstrated to them um, about underwater buoyancy and also talked a little bit about some of the issues that are facing um, our marine ecosystems. Students then decided, well, what were they going to do with that information? And so some students got together and they decided, hey, you know, we've figured out that really there's a lot of pollution in the ocean. We've heard about it. We've heard about the effects of that. And we really want to organize, you know, a, a, a cleanup. Um, and you see here, um, some students worked together with the older classmates and organize a strike around climate change. So they connected this issue of dolphins, whales, and sharks to a bigger topic of climate change. Um, so the connections are all being made by the students. The teacher is just driving this with really trying to capture their inquiries and their questions. So one of the questions might be, you know, how can, um, how does climate change affect our ecosystems? You know, and or what does a balanced ecosystem look like? You know, some questions uh, had to do with fish and, and as simple questions as when, you know, when fish uh, go to the bathroom, where does that end up? You know, and so kids are going to have all the types of questions. Um, it's up to us as teachers to, to draw it out of them. Now, this is a student here giving another student some feedback on their work. So they're doing some critique. And here is then the students presenting. So students had choice, the questions they explored the investigations that they conducted, the projects that they would complete, and the audience that they presented to. So think of how you might take your particular topic. So I've given you a couple examples. We start out with our flexible timetables, and you could design it around a learning experience that is a topic like entrepreneurship, and kids could all be creating their small businesses, and they have a choice in what businesses that they create and what they produce, but all of them are going to create businesses. Now, if you feel even more <laughs> courageous, um, and my hat's off to you if you do feel that way at this time, you can even extend that to having students choose completely the questions that they answer, the audience that they're going to present that to, and the project that they complete. That is full student autonomy that I just shared with you here. So now that I've showed you an example of what that looks like, think to yourself, how might you allow for more student voice and choice in their learning? Now, as we're going through each of these shifts, uh, if you have a question, please put that in the chat window um, because uh, Sarah is going to be monitoring that. Okay, so here's the question. How might you allow for more student voice and choice in their learning? So write that into your chat window now, and Sarah is going to be sharing those results with me. So great, I already see a great response here, empowering students. Great example, so think how might you empower your students? How might you discover what their passions are um, and empower them through those? Another thing that Sarah is also writing down that you put, which is great, is collaboration, communication. Take it a step further. You know, what might they be collaborating on? We say collaboration and communication a lot, but what does that look like when we're really helping support them in collaboration? So how are we taking them and connecting them to their peers? How are we taking their interests, connecting them to maybe parents, to their communities, and an audience to share that with? All right, so we're going to go now to poll number three and see what your results are. So we first poll, we had some high results. Um, and now we have this third poll around autonomy and freedom that you give to students in choosing their learning pathways.
Okay, here's your window for sharing. Great, Sarah, you're mentioning there's a lot of questions. Do you want, Sarah, just in the chat window, do you want to take those questions now? Or do you, do you think we should move on to uh, the, the other shifts and answer the questions at the end? So as Sarah's mentioning that there's a lot of questions around allowing students freedom and autonomy. So Sarah, let me know if you want to answer those now. Um, if not, we will definitely get to those um, at the end. We'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers. All right, thanks, Sarah. We're going to give you just a, a little more time for this poll, and we're going to move on. Pl we're going to have plenty of time. Don't worry. I promise you we we'll are have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, so I'm going to try to get to all of your questions. All right, so this poll is closing for now. If you want to go back and take the poll, you can, but I'm going to move on. Um, we're about at a 3.5. Excellent. This means that the desire is there. You allow for some choices, but you want to get uh, even deeper in terms of what choices you allow for, especially knowing that you have a curriculum to cover. So we're going to get to some of those answers. So let's move on. Number four, community. Okay. Now, what I'm going to present to you about community, some of you, if you're watching this and you're a school administrator, you're going to think in terms of of your school leadership lens, okay? Put your school leadership hat on and think about how you might be able to create these learning communities within your school. If it's a gigantic school, I'm gonna give you some examples of how you can do that. Now, if you're a teacher in a classroom, as you're looking at this, how might you really create a cohesive, trusting community? Chances are, if you're tuning this presentation, you're already that kind of teacher. So let's think about how can we take the learning community that we've developed, how can we develop that same kind of community online? Because we know how hard it is. I'm connecting you right now and I'm, I'm presenting through StreamYard. I can't see anyone's faces. It is very tough to create that community. I understand. But let's look at a couple strategies and how you can do that. Okay? So I know a lot of us are going back into school. Now I'm going to show you two pictures. Okay? If you have a large school... Chances are, you know, it's very hard for students to feel like they really stand out. It might be a bunch of fish in the same bowl, in the same colors. Now, notice the difference between this big bowl and the small bowl. <laughs> and I think it's pretty clear. Um, you don't have to write in the chat window. If I had you here in your class, I'd say, what are the differences? Some people would raise their hand. So let's just imagine... You're looking at these. What are some differences that strike you right away? And one of the differences you might notice between this very school-based, um, where a large lot of uh, kids are fitting into the same curriculum, same school, you might notice that in the smaller community-based uh, pond, you notice there's fish of different colors. Notice how they're a little larger. Um, they have a smaller pond to swim in, so they're seeing the same amount of fish continuously. And think about how that creates community. And now I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of small learning views and benefits because you might have been watching this presentation and you might be a little bit skeptical. This particular community that I'm sharing here um, is the uh, community uh, Futures Academy that was in the International School of Beijing. Uh, this is a small program that we started. And it was called Futures Academy. It was based around one, two, here's two of us, three teachers, and we had the same 24 students. Now, if you think back to the very first slide that I shared with you on the schedule, the way that you can create that kind of schedule is if you're seeing the same amount of students. If you're spread out across the whole school, it's hard for you to do that. Okay? But think about how you might create that sense of community. And these are the same community that was meeting um, every single morning during that advisory period to connect. So think about um, in your uh, community of learners, how might you create that feeling of connection and bonding every single day or at least within the week, especially if they're in a you know, hybrid type of situation. Um, so
So here's some benefits of small learning communities. It's going to enhance teacher efficacy and student participation. There was a study done on smaller learning communities, and teachers felt like they can make more of a difference. And uh, students also um, showed higher rates of participation and improves academic achievement. So by shrinking the size of your community, you're going to see better academic achievement uh, in students. Um, increased academic equity. So equity meaning in terms of the students who are not doing so well in those learning experiences and those standardized tests, uh, when it was a large community, started to show improved results, started to show um, improved ability within these learning experiences. So that is another advantage of having a smaller uh, community. Students also in small schools are more future ready. You had more uh, students when they're comparing uh, different samples that were attending college, that were attending uh, careers of their choice, and um, that had skills uh, that were future ready in these small communities. And you see improved behavior and extracurricular participation. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, how do I do that in my situation? So think about how you might create community in your particular uh, school. Um, a way to do that is to ensure that you're allowing each student to shine and show their differences. How do you allow for that within your learning experiences? How might you meet with those same groups of uh, students each day and really focus on their wellness? Um, and if you're at a large school and you're a school administrator, how might you create that opportunity for students and for teachers to connect uh, in daily uh, for learning? Okay, I see a lot of good responses so far that people are making. Uh, so Sarah, thanks for sharing some of the responses to the last question. Uh, some people, we were asking about student autonomy. Uh, we had a lot of good responses to that. So I do wanna get to your questions. And so now what we're gonna do next is we have one more um, thing to share. And that is, if you want to scan that code, that is, uh, goes directly to the results or sorry, not the results, but this study, if you want to explore this study in more detail. Now think, how might you create a feeling of community in your learners? Okay, so that's a question for you. How might you create this feeling of community within your groups of learners? What can you do to make people feel bonded and connected? And rate the closest of your learning community. I see a lot of people um, have responded to this and responded quite uh, positively so far. <clears throat> so as these poll results are coming in, Sarah shared some of the um, answers to uh, other uh, polls. So thanks, someone mentioned they're an ICT teacher and their organization gives them a lot of liberty and autonomy to decide what sort of learning they want to engage in. Autonomy is so important. So autonomy for you as a teacher and how you connect your curriculum and autonomy for your students and how they address your curriculum as well. So great response. Um, another response from the last question about student autonomy um, has to do with language and students can choose a topic of their choice for creative writing. That's excellent. Um, you have to teach creative writing, but students can take a topic of their interest, which is a great um, way to give option. Someone also mentioned student mentorship. Student mentorship is a great example of creating that community. Um, we used to have peer bracelets, and students who had a particular skill would wear that particular bracelet. So some of our students um, would mentor others when it came to um, creative storytelling. So we had a, a student who was a very creative storyteller, and when it came to writing, that student could support. We also had students who had wristbands who were really um, quite skilled when it came to math and their math aptitude and computation. So how might you, as this person mentioned, thanks so much for sharing that, um, have students mentor each other and serve as peers to each other. So thanks for sharing those results. Um, we're gonna move on to the last one, real world connection before, as I mentioned, um, I'm giving you about 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay, so here is our fifth structure that is underlined for um, student-centered learning, real-world connection. So think to yourself, 
how often do you give students an opportunity to connect what you're learning in the classroom to the real world? And I'm going to put two pockets here, okay? You see my hands, hopefully, in the screen. How often do we start with our curriculum? And then from our curriculum, at the end, we give them an opportunity to connect to the real world. But notice what I'm doing my hands here. I'm putting those two fingers together. What if we started our curriculum and we looked at the real world and we planned according to where those things link up? And so here you can see the two differences. On one hand, you've got school and community and what you try to do is link those two together. And on the other hand, you have school and community intricately linked, which is what I showed earlier in those learning experiences of the student-centered school. And that is where the project-based experiences are coming in. So how might you connect what you're doing in class, whether it has to do with math concepts and it has to do with business creation, um, or it has to do with potentially amusement park type of design um, when it comes to you know, a local amusement park. Um, maybe that's creative writing as mentioned. How can we use creative writing and have students take creative writing and use that skill to create podcasts, um, to create class books, um, to create the, these, uh, these series or, or these novel series and, and have published authors come in. So that's where we're going from isolated from real world to going to school as a real world. Now I'm going to share a couple examples for you. So you have uh, a way of uh, linking these two together. Now in this particular case, is, this is fascinating. This school saw this link between the immigrant population in the community and their school. And these students had noticed that these immigrants, um, they had asked questions about them and they're studying immigration and they're wondering, well, who are immigrants in our city? And what are their voices like? And this whole project was designed around bringing out the voices of the community immigrants. And if they could you know, speak and tell us their stories, what would they share? And in this particular learning experiences, these students all paired up with an immigrant from a different place. Um, they captured their stories. They then took those stories, put those things together, put together actual websites where you can find out more about that immigrant story. Inside of that website, you saw the geography, you saw the history of where that particular immigrant came from. You heard a little bit of their voice and capture that. You had the artwork, the original artwork that they created for that immigrant. And because they reached out to community, the community wanted to do more and they published these very professional books called Community Faces. And those books were used to actually fund an immigrant's green card into um, the United States. So there's no limit, there's no ceiling to what we can produce when we really are centered on students. And we're really trying to make those connections that students all want to see between our classroom and the real world. Okay, so I just shared that project. I want to get to Q&A, so I'm going to skip over the others. How might you connect with the real world outside of school? That's a provocation. I'm sure you probably have some responses in the chat window. You might have some questions as well. So if you have a question, put it in the chat window. If you have an idea, also write that. We're going to take our final poll, rate the level of connection in your uh, school or classroom to the real world. And we'll now get to probably a lot of, lot of questions there, I'm sure. Yes, we do have a lot of questions. Um, I have shortlisted a few because there were a few that were overlapping. As far as this poll is concerned, uh, we have received 82 responses so far. And I am, before we proceed to the questions, I'm going to deactivate this poll as well. OK. And here we are. OK, the first question. Um, can we implement student-led uh, PBL with a regimented curriculum like single national curriculum in Pakistan? Ah, good question. OK. So the answer is yes. There's probably a limit in terms of the kind of projects um, necessary you can create. So, you know, I had a curriculum I had to teach as a history teacher um, back in San Diego. So I, had a, I did have a very strict curriculum and I used that as a starting point. So I would start with looking at your subject and, and just thinking, how can I take one of my particular topics 
and make it a little bit more thematic. So one of the things you know we did is we looked at ancient civilizations and we tried to connect ancient civilizations to today. It was a very mandated curriculum. We had to look at Mesopotamia. We had to look at um, Egypt. You know, we had to look at um, ancient India. So we were looking at all those ancient civilizations and the kids would then design their own civilizations based on some of the insights that they got from those and created just very small models for what those civilizations could look like. That was just taking four or five lessons and just making it a little bit more thematic. So I wanted to give you that as an example. Um, I know you, you know, you have a very strict curriculum, but try to start with one topic within that curriculum and see how you can make it a little bit more student centered and a little bit more hands on. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll proceed with the next question. This is an interesting one too. What about syllabus coverage and meeting completion deadlines? Ah, okay. So like pacing guides, right? <laughs> so you have to, you have to complete a certain part of the syllabus at a certain time. Yes. I, I think this kind of relates to the last one, right? I mean, if you don't have flexibility in your schedule to do what I showed in the first schedule, don't get caught up in the schedule necessarily, right? Start with your classroom and yes, you might have an end date for a certain topic that you have to cover or for a certain amount of content you have to cover. But I just worked with a math teacher and she opened up uh, a geometry challenge and it was just simply taking origami. And the kids all had their different types of origami that you created. They had to do all the calculations for angles. They had to um, look at the geometric shapes and she was actually able to get into calculus type concepts just by taking origami and something the kids were already interested in, connecting the two. And that was a start for her. Now she's excited and she's gun ho and she's gonna make larger types of projects around math board games. So again, my um, suggestion is start small, look at one place that you can do that. Okay, the next question is, it is unfortunate, but our community um, still seems fixated on high stakes examinations and mandated standardized tests. By incorporating PBL only in our day-to-day -day teaching and then reverting to regimented testing and examination systems, aren't we moving in two different directions? Can both ever be amalgamated? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. I, you know these, I already predict all these questions come up. They're always the same. <laughs> I think they can. Um, I will say that at High Tech High, which is where I was at initially, which a lot of people might know is a very famous project-based school. Um, I, and I will also vouch for the AP um, system because there's research that just came out. I, I strongly suggest that you look this up. Um, look up uh, Edutopia and their research that they had just done on PBL. And PBL actually leads to higher academic results, even in standardized tests. We never taught to the test at High Tech High but yet our students were continually improving in their results. Um, so yes, I think they can exist side by side. What's more important is that we're teaching students problem solving methodology. We're teaching them critical thinking. So whereas yes, in certain math, there are gonna be concepts you have to teach them. For a lot of these types of tests, it's very much critical thinking, problem solving, and they're gonna show increased results. A last case study that I can share with you is that we did our math curriculum entirely through Khan Academy. It was all online. Students moved at their own pace. We would just, as teachers, you know, have the interventions to sit beside them and mentor them where they should be going. And those students were a year level beyond where their peers were, and they scored consistently higher on their math results. So I do think they can live side by side. I don't think you need to teach to the test. I think you teach the skills and that, that and you take your curriculum and you teach in a more open, student-centered way, and those results will come. Great, thank you. The next one is, PBL requires continuous interaction between peers. How can that happen when the students are socially isolated and it is taking a toll on them? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, and I would say first, the, the bigger question, the deeper question beyond that is how do you create a social atmosphere in a socially distanced environment? And that in and of itself is a great project. Um, because like I said, the schools that are doing that, for example, those kids created a class community cookbook. They did that all online. They put that together in a Google slide deck. They 
made the whole PDF. They had a design team. They had each student who had a different recipe. And yes, they were doing those projects individually, but they had to come together to put those things together. So I would say what you should do instead of doing class, 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 is look at the project and look at what students are going to do, put the kids in teams and think mm -hmm. digitally how they might be able to work online. Students also did an amusement park in their local place. I think they used edu spaces, co-spaces is what they used. And the kids worked together to put together amusement parks. They're all working in the virtual environment. Minecraft, students are even designing Minecraft worlds and they're incorporating tons of concepts of geography into these Minecraft worlds. So um, it is a challenge, but what I would first start with is looking at, well, what is the project that you're asking students to do? How can we make that more social? And how can we get teams collaborating um, in an online environment? Great, thank you. The next question that we have is, when things go back to normal, how can we ensure that our focus remains on teaching of mastery and not test scores? Uh, teaching of mastery and not test scores. Okay, I assume, I assume what they mean by this is just really going deeper with learning and not just going shallow just to get the test concepts. Um, to be honest, I mean, I know people have pacing guides, but I would set aside, you know, an hour or two hours. You don't do everything project-based at first because we do have pacing guides that we have to adhere to. So I would say, you know, go deep with a few concepts initially. So start with one particular unit that you just want to go deeper in and not just go, you know, shallow. And I've seen, again, teachers have done that um, through, you know, making one real world project. So maybe it's narrative writing and you want to, you know, have kids create um, an actual book, you know, a published book together. They're going to go deep. They're not just going to do a quick narrative writing piece. Go deep in that concept. And then for the other concepts, you can still teach those side by side. Um, so that would be, you know, a way that you can go deep with a few concepts and teach for mastery and then not just, you know, teach the standardized test. I would say also, too, to change your rubrics. Um, I think that's quite important. You know, change the way that you're assessing students. If you're going to assess based on mastery, give them multiple opportunities to succeed and give them authentic forms of assessment. So don't really report out until the end. I think, Kyle, you've answered half of the next question that I was about to ask, but I'll still ask nonetheless. The biggest concern regarding following a PBL approach is the authenticity of assessments. What kind of assessments can authentically mirror the way students work should be analyzed and evaluated? Hmm. So um, I would say you, ass you assess them authentically um, is number one. So look at the project and look at what people in the real world have to do towards that project. So the business one that I introduced you to, they had to write a business plan, right? Now in a business plan, and if I'm a language teacher, I'm teaching them organization. You know, I'm teaching them fluency. I'm teaching them word choice. I'm teaching them, you know, syntax. I'm teaching all of these concepts through that project. So rather than getting hung up on, now they're gonna take a paper pencil test, they submit to me the business plan, the different iterations, and I'm simply going, okay, here's what you need to focus on. You need to focus on your organization. Okay, you've got a great opening, you've got lots of fluency, but really your word choice could be better. So it allows for authentic assessment and I could still get to my standards through that. So hopefully I have answered that question. Yes, yes. We'll take one quick question before it's time to say goodbye and, and wrap up. Uh, what to do with those students who are not attending the classes online? How can I ensure student participation? Mm. So the students who aren't taking the classes online, like the ones who aren't showing up, do you mean? Yes. You, okay. Okay. So this, first of all, I, I think, well, why are they not showing up? If they're not showing up because it's an internet connection or something else, um, then I would make them accountable to more than just you. You know, I'd make them accountable to an actual group as well. So if they're just showing up to tune into your content that you have to teach them that to show four or five times a day, they might have their camera off. But if they are now accountable to a group within a project and they have an actual real deadline to meet with a real audience that they're going to be presenting to, chances are they're going to be a lot more engaged, a lot more empowered, and you're going to see attendance go up. That's one of the things I share with you. When projects start, attendance goes up, participation goes up as well. So. I would really use those strategies of really making them accountable to more than just you and have those deadlines in place that are really authentic. Um, so that, that's it for me, Sarah. I guess the last thing I'm gonna share is if you wanna get the book that has you know all of these kind of strategies in it, 
it's called you know the power of simple and it goes a lot more into detail in, into some of the strategies thank you thank you so much um i have about 24 other questions that i would be happy to share with you and and i would expect responses which can then be posted uh, you know to the participants of the workshop but uh, on behalf of Beacon House, Mr. Kyle, I would like to thank you for such a captivating and thoroughly engaging session. I would also like to thank the participants uh, who had tuned in from all over the world for their participation and, and how passionately they were asking questions and responding to your questions and taking uh, you know, a part in the poll as well, the audience polls. Uh, moreover, I would also like to thank our lead sponsor of the conference, which is UBL. Uh, before we close for the break, please take a minute to share your feedback about the session on our website. This will help us improve our future events and sessions. Thank you very much. Stay positive, stay smart, stay safe, and good night. Thanks, everyone.